I don't think I'm talking about anything that could be conceivably contentious, but you never know these days, do you? Uh, so what I need to announce before I even begin is that I am not Italian. I am not of Italian stock, as far as I know, and I don't speak Italian. So I am a complete outsider to this community. Uh, whether it's appropriate that I talk about them, I leave up to you. Um, now, although the Italians in Britain were never as numerous as the Irish and the Jews, the Italian community in cultural terms punched above its weight. And I think that the impact of Italians in terms of a higher art is not disputed by anybody. But really what I'm talking about today is the less uh, highbrow uh, consequences of Anglo-Italian contacts. Very few working class memoirs that I've read about the North of England fail to mention the organ grinders who came round the streets. In Leeds, they were called the Tingalarine, and nobody seems to know what the origin of that was. Uh, in, before the First World War, it was estimated that one in four Italians living in England were actually, the consensus usually rather politely called from street music. Um, so there we are. Uh, the other thing that sticks in people's minds is in fact the ice cream men who came round. Now in Lancashire we never called them the hokey pokey men but you may do over in Yorkshire, I don't know. Uh, they're certainly called hokey pokey in other parts of the country and it comes from the Italian apparently this is where you can tell I don't speak Italian. Uh, it, it comes from Occipoco which means how cheap, uh, good value, that sort of phrase. Um, when you bought ice cream in these early days, there weren't yet the cornets or the wafers that we were used to today. You bought them in little glasses uh, and they were called penny lips. And then you licked them out the glass and then you handed them back to the glass, to the, the ice cream man. And believe me, these penny lit glasses, people collect them. And they're really quite expensive on eBay. eBay, I Googled it, thought, oh, I'll buy a couple. But no, I'm afraid that they're, oh, they're like 40 pounds and things like that. So, but that's how they were served. Um, and I think one of the reasons that um, the, it cropped, the Italian presence in Britain crops up so frequently is that they were highly visible. And they were highly visible, particularly to young children, and made, in fact, a mark on their early lives, which then they uh, carried over into their adulthood. Now, last week, one of the things that Derry talked about was the methodological problems of working out how many of the immigrant communities were in Britain at any one time. One of the things about the census, which is the obvious record to go to, is that it would only record you um, as being an Italian if you were foreign born. Uh, so the figures I'm about to give you are people who, in the census return, have actually uh, written that they were born in Italy, sometimes given the name of the place, sometimes not. In one or two cases in the, in the sense that it's in from foreign parts, uh, but it's obviously concerning which foreign parts they were coming from. In, uh, I'm talking first of all about the national figures. In 1861, there were 3,794 3, Italians in Britain. You know, given this limited definition, that you've got to be Italian born to be counted. By 1911, there were 21,000. So this is a phenomenon, particularly at the closing years of the 19th century. 
most of them, over half, lived in London, in specific areas like Parkerwell. Uh, the highest second concentration was actually in Glasgow. Uh, and those of you who go to Glasgow will see Italian shop names, won't be over shops or everywhere. Um, and the third highest concentration was in Manchester. Um, the figures for Leeds look in fact really quite tiny compared with the national figures. So that in 1871, there were 54 Italians. In 1881, there were 113. In 1901, there were 195, and at that stage there were 2,000 in Manchester, so you can see the difference. Um, when, in fact, war broke out, the local press reported that there were 300 Italians in these. That seems an underestimate to me, because, in fact, uh, if, in fact, you know, the, the earlier figures are figures for, in fact, the... Um, <coughs> For in fact, those foreign born, the Italians have been present so long that you would have thought that they would have made more than 300 million. But that's the best figure that we've actually got. Because it was so small, the population of Italians, there was no Little Italy, uh, which you would find in Manchester, uh, for example. So that, you know, but they did live in a very concentrated area. Um, this is the area around St. Patrick's Church. So they're clustering in those slum areas around Marsh Lane, along yeah. York Street, the bottom of York Road. So that is their patch. Um, now, I think we often think of Italian immigrants as coming from the south of Italy, but the early immigrants, and for the most of the 19th century, the majority of uh, Italian folk who came to reside in Britain were actually from the north, uh, from the mountainous areas of north. It's not really until the end of the 19th century that you begin to get any significant numbers of southerners coming here. Now, like much else in Italy, for those of you who know it well, uh, there are very strong regional loyalties and regional traditions. And that goes as far as occupations. So that, as we will see in a minute or two, those people who were glass blowers, barometer makers, mirrors, thermometers, they all came from the area around Como. So don't come from anywhere else, just from Como. These are the Italians who came from Luca. And if you know that part of Tuscany, in fact, they particularly came from Bardi. Uh, they're making plaster figurines, not holy figures. They usually refer to as the figurati, or in English called the image men. But they're usually doing classical figures. In fact, uh, small, small classical figures, mythological figures, sometimes politicians or famous men like Napoleon. Um, sometimes they're, they're painted in bronze, so they look as if, in fact, they were, um, they, they, they were metal. Um, and it was a seasonal, as much Italian work was seasonal, and they carried them round on these headboards. So you walked along with those on your head, uh, and you went to fairs, and you can see in this case, it used to be quite a respectable house. Um, the other area, <clears throat> which we'll come across again, this is Parma. It was one of the poorest parts of Italy. Um, this is a particular village where lots of the Italians in Leeds came from, and they, again, specialised in organ grinding. Now, we can look at the Italian presence in Leeds in three phases, from the middle of the 18th century to, let's say, 1820s, they're really very high skilled craftsmen. They're gilders, they're picture framers, they're mirror makers, they seem to monopolize mirror making. They're instrument makers, they're jewelers. 
Then 1830s, there's greater diversity coming. So you get the figurati that we just talked about. You get the beginning of street musicians. You get hawkers in drapery, fancy goods and toys. They seem to particularly specialise in toys. And some later on, by the beginning of the 20th century, huge toy shops in these. Now, of course, all of these are gone. Now, the these immigrants share many of the characteristics of other immigrant groups. When they first came, they were usually young, they were usually unmarried. They, at the early, in the early years, actually they married e uh, English girls or particularly Irish girls, because Irish girls would share the religious faith with them. When they first come over, they have no aspirations to stay here. Their view is, is to earn some money, send money home to their families, eventually have a little nest egg, go back to Italy, buy a bit of land and settle down. Um, now, what happens is the phenomenon that we know as chain migration. Once you get somebody from a village like uh, Santa Maria here, then they will bring other members of their family over and also their, their neighbours. So Peter Maturi will be talking about later on. By the time he's personally established, he's bringing his uh, family and friends over from Pinzola. Um, the other thing that, uh, that characterised them was sometimes known in uh, it, the English press as the wandering Italians. And this is partly because they wander backwards and forwards between different towns in Britain. So that you know, if you come across a family which I'll mention in a minute, the politics, you find more over the place. Uh, now, sometimes it's brothers and sisters, but sometimes it's them. They're actually wandering, they don't settle. And they also go back to Italy frequently, perhaps have a couple of years back in Italy, then come back uh, over here. Uh, so it, they're quite difficult to keep track of. Um, something that I can't very easily explain, they don't anglicise their surnames, they always keep their surname, but they do anglicise their Christian names. Not all of them, there are plenty of Luigi's, but there are also plenty of Luigi's. Uh, for some reason, there are ever so many Johns, um, and I don't understand really why. And then, I, again, there's a lot of Jameses as well. So they, some of them change to English Christ, Christian names. They are Christian names in English context, English first names. Uh, and, uh, but they don't seem to change their perhaps surnames. The other thing I want to stress is the importance of family life to the Italian way of life. Uh, so they are very close bonds within families. They often live together in multi-generational uh, households. The other thing I need to remind you of is that until 1871, Italy was not a united country. Uh, so your loyalty was to your region, sometimes your town, your village, uh, and that sense of Italianness, which seems sort of so obvious. If you know any Italians, it's actually quite fragile, except for football and the World Cup, things like that. But it's fragile, both of them. Now, the first Italian that I know who put down roots in, it, in, in Leeds is absolutely untypical. We call him Horace Catania, who was born in 1739 in Genoa. He seems to have been a Protestant. His Italian name was Aranzio, which he anglicizes into Hori. Um, why he came to Leeds is not at all clear. There, are, there is a community of foreign-born merchants living in Leeds 
as in fact the woolen industry becomes so important here. Um, and I am imagining that there were, certainly were Leeds merchants exporting to Genoa, which is where he's from. Now he may have been engaged as an agent for them, or he may have just been doing business with them in Genoa, but I would imagine that he's got some background in, in fact, the woolen cloth industry before, in fact, he comes. He's certainly in Leeds by 1764, and he marries an English woman. Um, he, uh, he forms a partnership uh, in 1776 with Gamaliel um, Lloyd, who Lloyd's very famous uh, uh, woolen merchant specialising in the export trade. Um, and this partnership prospered. And that's his, Catania's house. It's looking a bit down at the hill uh, there. He moved in, it's in South Parade. Uh, he moved there in uh, 1777, the year that he took out his naturalisation papers. But it must have been a very splendid house. And from the insurance, we know what it was like. It had four living rooms on the ground floor, had seven bedrooms, had servants' room in the attic. There was a servants' floor in the basement. There was a brew house and a wash house. There was stabling for four horses a large warehouse. The house was valued at £1,300 and its contents were valued at £655. So he is being integrated really into the Leeds merchant community. Um, the goods in his warehouse, which was behind the house here, were worth £6,000. And he just lives the life which is not much different than, in fact, uh, other woolen merchants. Uh, he worships at St John's, so whether he changed from being a Catholic when he came here or whether he was a, a Protestant originally, I don't know, because he's buried in St John's too. And he did things like subscribe to the building of the third white cloth wall. He uh, was a subscriber to the infirmary. And Kevin will believe, be pleased to hear he was a member of the Leeds Library. Uh, and he also was a founder of the Foreign Library, uh, which is now integrated into the Leeds Library. Uh, in 1778, he organised a series of subscription concerts at the Assembly Rooms. So they've got somebody uh, who is absolutely a million miles away from the poor Sicilian immigrant who's going to come very much later. The other Italian, I'm presuming, now this is a presumption, uh, was Joseph Puguri. Now I think that's an Italian name and indeed when I checked it, it does come up as an Italian name. He was the innkeeper and brandy merchant working from these premises, which were the nags head on the clay. Um, he died in 1802, and the business was left to his wife, Christina, Christina Anna, and she kept it going until the 1930s. The other 18th century Italian resident at Leeds, was T.L. Tolte, and this is one of his barometers, uh, and it's signed with the date, and it says, of Leeds. Um, made in 1790, and as I said before, the Poltys are very famous makers of barometers. Um, so that we've got probably very few people who are resident in the 18th century, and then the first years of the 19th century are consumed by the wars with uh, the French and Napoleon. Uh, so if we look at early 19th century migration, the Napoleonic Wars had devastating effects on North Italy. 
uh, land was in fact um, <coughs> devastated. It, Italy was plunged into a recession. There were famine. And all this led to a wave of Italian migration, something that was actually encouraged. They're coming to England was encouraged by a British government who wanted to enhance the skills of, in fact, British craftsmen and felt that one way of doing it was to employ Italians who would perhaps teach them. If I look at the Leeds directories, between 1815 and 1853, I've got the names of 14 Italians who were living in Leeds. They're largely very skilled craftsmen producing luxury goods for a growing middle-class market. So we've got Peter Lira on cue. Uh, there he is. Uh, Joseph Polti, not the same one who produced the barometer we saw before, but another one. Uh, we've got Mark Bernasconi, who makes um, barometers too. Damiano Catano. He is. Um, and Antonio Fattorini. Oh, uh, and Pellegrino Vassolini as well. Um, so this seems to have had a monopoly of the glass and mirror trade, and also that of gilding and making picture frames. In terms of their residences, they tend to cluster around the markets, that sort of area, often in the yards behind the market. And when in fact they became more settled, and they became a little bit wealthier. They would move on to the street frontages. And then later on, if things went well for them, uh, they would, in fact, have shops on Brigat. So that um, Damiano Catania, him, he ends up on Brigat, and as does the toy dealers, Luvoni and Cusinelli. Um, some of these people, wealthy, skilled craftsmen, stay in Leeds, some of them don't, they just disappear. Uh, maybe they go to other towns in Leeds, maybe they've made enough money to buy themselves some land back in Italy. Now, one of the families that some of you will be familiar with is the Patalinis. Uh, until very recently, they still had a shop on, on, on uh, Parliament Street in Harrogate. Antonio, who you can see there, was born in 1793 in Lombardy. He came to Leeds after the Napoleonic Wars and he opened up a stall in the bazaar off Brigat. Um, it's a fancy goods dealer, really. Um, they had 10 children. The first four of them were born in Leeds. Recognising the business opportunities from the emerging Harrogate Spa, they opened a branch in Harrogate in 1831 at Two Royal Parade. Then in 1853, they had a third outpost in Bradford, who was under the, which was under the supervision of his sons, John and Edward. And then there was a fourth branch in Skipton. Which was, uh, it looks even worse when they vanquish that. Uh, it shouldn't be innocent. Uh, but anyway, um, now innocent was particularly sharp businessman. As soon as they opened the shop, he had what he called a 20-week purchasing club, which meant that what you and I would call higher purchase. Uh, so he got 20 weeks and paid off in installments until in fact you paid off the whole of the sum. And after the First World War, Batterini is skipped and in a sense he's no longer around developed it into empire stores and grassons. They went into the catalog business. Um, and as I've said, the uh, 
the, the branches closed everywhere except for the one in Harrogate, which lasted just until very recently. Now, the success of the Paterinis is only one phase of Italian immigration at this time. At the other end of the scale, from about the 19, 1830s onwards, were the floods of Italian young children, usually boys, who could be found begging in the streets of London. Now, these Italian boys had not walked to England by themselves. The trading children was organized by a padrone. Uh, what a padrone did was he would approach impoverished parents and he would offer to take their young children <laughs> off their hands for a set number of years. So it's an indenture sort of system. Uh, so they get a lump sum, and their children then walk with the Padrone to Britain. Their contract would be three years, five years, that sort of thing. I don't think we know how they were got back to Italy, whether they were taken by the Padrone or whether they had to make their own way. I don't actually know. Um, and the Padrone is a term that's used in Italian, both for the contractor of labour, but also for the employer of labour. So usually a contractor or an employer would have a troop of between about 10 and 12 children whom he fed, clothed and housed as they journeyed across Europe. It took a month to walk from Northern Italy to in fact, England and you had to cross, you cross from Calais. Mm -hmm. Uh, the young boys couldn't speak English, often didn't learn any English while they were here. Uh, they slept in dormitories um, and they were out in the streets uh, alone, or two or three of them, but two or three children, so, uh, begging all day long. When they came back, the proceeds of the day's begging went to the padroni. Sometimes to attract attention, they had little animals with them, particularly fa favourite were white mice. I thought English people would be attracted by mice, <laughs> but they mustn't have seen white mice. They had them in a cage. And sometimes these boys were called the mice boys, which helped to show guinea pigs, tortoises, uh, an occasional monkey. Sometimes they carry boxes of waxed figures, or they might play very simple tunes on rudimentary harps. Um, now, this does cause <coughs> in London something of a moral panic, uh, and I won't go into that at the moment. But let me give you an instance. It, this, this trade was not confined to. It was his greatest signal, but it was by no means confined to. This is an instance. In 1861, a census records 26 people living in a lodging house at Two Lum Square, which is off York Street. All of them were born in Italy. All the men described themselves as musicians. Some were living with their wives and children, but there were also single men from the ages of 11 to 23. And I suspect that these have been brought over by somebody. I don't know who. Uh, the, the house in Lum, uh, in Lum Square was just an ordinary little back to back. So how on earth they all got in there? I don't know. Um, in the same year, 1861, the local paper carries uh, a notice of a reward for a, of a pound for information regarding the whereabouts of two brothers, Antonio and David Gassigna. Now, both of those have been living in the house of Lum Lane, uh, in Lum Square, and obviously gone missing. Uh, now, whether they were found and brought back, I don't know. Their story ends much more happily, however, though I haven't got time to go into it, because they opened quite a famous restaurant in Berlin. Uh, but that's a totally different story. 
This is another example. Um, uh, the Yorkshire Post in 1878 uh, reports the arrest for begging of Rata Volante, who's 14, and her brother, Fortunato. And they've been begging outside the home of the mayor of Leeds in St Anne's Lane. The children spoke barely any English. They told the police that they had no idea where they lived. Uh, the police eventually managed to track down the parents, whether they are the parents, of course, we have no idea. Um, and through a translator, the father, he's arrested, the father informs the magistrate that the family had come to a, from Atino near Naples. He'd been un, unable to find work in Italy. So three years ago, he traveled to England and he worked as an organ grinder, but currently his organ needed repair. The police, in fact, didn't find him, but warned him uh, that if, in fact, this happened again, the children would put, be put in an industrial school. And the police, in their evidence, said that they had arrested four or five Italian children begging in the streets of Leeds in the months leading up to this arrest that had been reported. The problem was, for them, because you see, the boy, the children didn't speak English. He still speaks Italian. Uh, and it's very difficult to know what you do with, as we know, only too well these days, what you do with children. who um, you know you've got to help, but you don't know quite how to do it. From the 1880s, we get what we would think of as mass migration from Italy. Between unification, and the First World War, 15 million Italians left Italy. That's one in four of the population. The majority traveled to the USA, to Brazil, to Argentina. But between 1881 and 1901, the Italian population of Leeds, of, of England doubles. Uh, now, although these new immigrants largely come from the North still, Odd, they're odd southerners, but they largely come in from the north and they lack specialized skills that had characterized those who'd come earlier in the 19th century. So, a lot of them, this is a Leeds Herd Gurdy man uh, with his two monkeys, he's ground uh, if it's somewhere in Hare Hills. Um, and an article in the Leeds Times uh, states that half of the Italians in Leeds were either um, organ grinders or were in fact ice cream sellers. Um, now street organs, like the one you see here, cost 18 pounds to buy, uh, which would be beyond what any poor American could afford, but you could hire them and the cost of the hiring was a shilling a day. So presumably, if you were out all day, uh, you would make a shilling and obviously make something for your rent and your food and so on and so forth. So that was a normal practice to hire. The monkeys didn't come from the person who hired the organs. You had to provide your own, uh, your own monkeys. Now, there was, until the 1940s, a very famous barrel organ maker in Leeds, which some of you will have heard about. Uh, it's Luigi Vincenzo Tomasso, uh, born in 1863, dies in 1944. He was born in extreme poverty in the village of Alpino, north of Casino. Uh, when he was eight, he was sold to a Padagone, along with his sister and his brother, possibly because his father was in prison. And they walked to Calais, where the Padagone was in fact refused entry. So they all had to walk back to Italy. One child was so poorly that in fact they 
the pajoli just left the child because he was holding up the the rest of the group. Um, age 12, Tommaso sets out again. Don't know this with the pajoli, but he finds work in London with a firm that still exists. There was the Chiaros, uh, who are organ makers and still are. Uh, and he worked for them for 10 years. And then he moves to Leeds in 1887. He sets up business first in St. Mary's Row and then later in Bowman Lane. And he too maintains his practice of bringing family over, friends over, for neighbours over, from the village of Alpino. One of the people he brings over uh, is Antonio Miele, who works as an organ grinder, uh, goes back to it during the First World War, and then comes back. And if any of you from uh, from Hunslet, this is the local Italian Hunslet ice cream maker. He is the Mele, so he would be well known there. Um, That is uh, Luigi's grave. The, if you ever go round um, Killingbeck Cemetery, it's absolutely fascinating because this is where, in fact, the Ukrainians, the Poles, and the, um, the Italians and the Irish are buried. Uh, and it's incredibly interesting. Um, so that's where he's buried. Uh, now, that is his grandson, Enrico. Enrico Tommaso is quite a famous jazz trumpeter in Britain. His father, Ernesto, was a clarinetist and played the working men's clubs and had an act with his wife. Uh, and as a young boy, uh, Ernesto said, uh, <coughs> sorry, Enrico said to his father, he liked to play the trumpet, it was bought. And, um, Louis Armstrong was coming to the Battery Variety Club for a two week engagement. And so uh, uh, Ernesto, Ernie was called, Ernie took his son Enrico to meet him at the airport and introduce him. And apparently uh, Louis Armstrong was entranced and said to him, I want you to come and see me every night. Come to my dressing room and we'll talk about trumpet playing. Uh, and there is a whole heap of photographs of this young boy with in fact um, Louis Armstrong. The other thing which I found touching, this is Ernesto's grave in Killingbeck. Uh, which is presumably put up by Enrico and uh, other members of the family. And it says, and he wrote you in it, uh, thank you for the love, the happiness, and all the music. Uh, so it's not often you see something that's quite a sort of touching as that uh, on a, um, a gravestone. Now, I once read that there was a dancing bear wandering down the streets of Leeds. And I really didn't believe it. I thought, yeah, this is like nostalgia gone mad, you know, dancing bears. But then quite by accident, I was reading uh, the Evening Post uh, for 1914, I think I was looking at the outbreak of war actually, and this report, the sorry spectacle of a dancing bear performing in the streets of Leeds. Now, although the journalist who was detailed to cover this story did discover the names of the two musicians who owned the poor animal, they did live in Lum Square again, in, in fact, a lodging house. And what the journalist does, which is very interesting, I don't know anybody else has ever been able to do this, he followed them to the streets of Leeds for the whole day. So we know where they played, you could track the route all the way. Uh, they started out 
Hakas nine and break it down. Uh, yeah, uh, I actually got back at, at seven. Um, during that time, the bear gave 108 performances. Uh, so he was on a muzzle, and they would throw him a stick, and he would pick, pick, he would catch it, and he would wave it. He would dance round as he did. Um, and there was some other trick that he did, which I can't remember now. Now, the other thing that looms very large in childhood memories is the ice cream vendor. Ice cream has been known since at least the 17th century, but it was always a luxury food. And the reason why it was so expensive was not really because of the ingredient, it was because of the cost of the ice. This is why, in fact, you go around stately homes, they have ice houses you know, dug in the hillside. Um, but it only becomes, in fact, available for, as a treat for poorer people when, in fact, steamships begin to travel between England and Canada and they bring back ice. Uh, and so you get all over the country, you, know, you get ice storage places and um, the ice cream men would go and buy their ice there, which is absolutely essential to the making of ice cream. Um, the first one that I can find in Leeds, and it seems about right for the period, is Antonio Mazza. Um, so he's in the census of 1881 as an ice cream maker. And unbelievably, we have a photograph in Regent Street here, and there she's Barrow, uh, Barrow, with the with the ice cream. And if you can, I don't know if you can see it from there, but it actually says his name on, on the barrel. Um, he was born in Palmer, uh, lived off York Street, uh, but was rapidly joined by other Italian ice cream makers. This is one of the Brizzarolas, it was two, this is John, uh, and then there was one called uh, Anthony, uh, and then there was the Grinellis. Uh, so this is Fernando Grisel, Grinell, oh, Grinelli, and this is one of his ice cream carts. The Brizzarolas were born near Genoa, and they married into the De Lucci family. Uh, Fernando Grinelli came from Parma, and he has with him in the 1901 census a brother called Cairo. Um, and they're also they're living with Luigi Massa. Um, Ferdinand also marries, then brings over another brother called Carlo to work with him. Um, and to complete our family, his, our history of the ice cream families, there's the Lusardi. Uh, Modesto was married to Ferdinand Grinelli's sister. Uh, and so he gets drawn into the ice cream business. He comes to work uh, for Ferdinand and then sets up by himself. Now, um, I'm not sure how far you can see this, but if you look at the second row, uh, the second from the left with a walking stick, that's Fernando Granelli. And if you look right along the row to the very last person, that's Carlo uh, Granelli, and he dies in the First World War. Uh, so this is a joining together of, I don't know any of the other names, uh, of Italians from Manchester and Italians from Leeds. Um, one of the problems with ice cream making is that it is a seasonal trade. Don't sell a lot of ice cream in the winter. And some of these ice cream vendors would turn 
to things like uh, hot chestnut for the winter months. Uh, my father used to buy peas, this was in Manchester, with you fat vinegar from the ice cream man in the winter. Um, and uh, they sold tea times in fact baked potatoes. But there was never enough demand, really, um, compared with, in fact, what it was like in the summer months. Um, and so once they'd been established and they began to make good, they bought their own little shops. Uh, and here you can see, uh, this is one of the Brasserola shops. This is a green road in Meanwood. It's another green road altogether. Uh, and they sell ice cream and they branch out to chocolate and cigs and, you know, all these sort of things. Often have little sarsaparilla satspar stores inside. In fact, I forgot who it was, but he used to go and drink sarsaparilla at Grinelli's on the market. Um, so that, you know, it becomes a little business. Uh, and of course, it's not a big step from that to Cathy. And it's not a big step from Cathy to in fact bars, and particularly in the 1960s, coffee bars, but also coffee bars. So you can trace the occupational trajectory of these ice cream families who came in the 1880s. And it's one or two cases are still around, but very far from just selling ice cream, I can tell you. Uh, some of them are really rather, rather, rather wealthy. Um, so, this is Gallucci's shop. You can see all the things that he's selling. And this is Modesto Lusardi. Uh, he had three shops on Park Lane as well as his ice cream business. And when he retired, he went to live on Cardigan Road. Uh, I, I think I've got the number down, so, but it was quite a splendid house there. And he was devoted to his garden. So um, now another name that in fact most of us will know, most of us will remember, is Peter Maturi. He was one of 25 children Born in 1880 in Pinzola in Trentino in the Dolomites. This was a town celebrated for its knife grinding. Age 16, he travelled to Lugano and then, in fact, he came to England where he'd already got four brothers in the living. Uh, he arrived uh, in England when he was 18 uh, and he opened up. Oh, I think this is a shop up, yes, on George Street. He opened this at the shop in 1899, opposite the entrance to Kirkgate Market. Um, so it's down the side of the market, one of those entrances. Oh, there's, uh, originally he was on a bank uh, and had a knife grinding uh, thing in front, you know. Uh, then he got a horse and car, so he gets wealthier. And then he got yachting. Uh, so this is uh, what he was using uh, in the 1930s. Um, as a complete aside to this, I said Pinzola was famous for that knife grinding. Um, and there we can see uh, the public sculpture in Pinzola today of a knife grinder. But the aside is, who also came from Pinzola was the star of yesteryear, Victor Mature. He was a mature. Um, so the, you know, he was one of the ones who went to America there from, but uh, this one came to England. Um, now, like other immigrants who arrived, for economic reasons in these. They live in some of the, challenge live in some of the worst property in the city. Uh, property that was condemned in the early uh, 1890s. It's the area that we roughly call Quarry Hill now, but it took a long time to clear it. 
and the conditions were quite dreadful and they were overcrowded. Uh, again, by accident, I just found the, a reference to an organ grinder called Camino Canale, who lived in Vienna Street off York Street. There were three rooms plus a kitchen. And squeezed into those three rooms were his wife and child, child children between three months and 16. Also living in the house was an organ grinder and his wife called Antonio Di Camillo. And there was also in another room, uh, Giuseppe Bacriola and his wife. There were 11 people living in three rooms in 1911. Um, now, I'd originally intended to uh, continue my story to the period after the First World War, but really I hadn't got space to do that. Uh, so I'm not going up after uh, 1918, that will have to wait. Um, what is difficult to ascertain is whether it, the Italians are chewing and throwing backwards and forwards from Italy a lot, how far they ever identified with England, how far they identified with Lee, is really quite tricky uh, to come to any conclusion about. Um, let's see. Oh, oh, these are weddings. What I, I put this on, I won't dwell on it now. Uh, these are the Italian clans joining together. And what you can see when you look at them is the Lissardis, the Grinellis, the Brasarola, the Maturis, they're all intermarrying and going to each other's weddings. Uh, now that's Ferdinand Pennelli, and he went back to Italy in the 1890s to do his Italian military service. And this is Gilanoni. Uh, uh, who went back to Italy to do his military service in 1925. So they were still, most of the Italians were not naturalised, partly because of the expense of national, getting your uh, papers ready. Uh, and so when the First World War breaks out, they're actually found in a bit of a quandary. Italian families usually registered the births of their children in Italy as well. Uh, as well as in England. So uh, there we are. That, so they, they're doing their military service, <coughs> which you don't have to do, uh, voluntarily really, because they're in England. Um, when war breaks out, of course, Italy is on part of the Triple Alliance. So really should have been fighting with Germany and Austria against uh, the Triple Entente countries. Italy doesn't join them. And in 1915, joins in with, in fact, uh, the Triple Entente powers. Now, this is the war memorial in Santa Maria, which we've really have seen before. There are 22 names on it, and nine, uh, and nine of them are from me. Uh, and they're fighting uh, either in British army colours, or in such Italian army colours. Um, and there's one who, this is the, the martyr family, this is Rocco. He had eight sons who fought in the British army in the Second World War, in the First World War. Four of them died. Uh, and he had 37 relatives in the British army in the First World War. So they made the supreme sacrifice, but it is, I think, an area which is very difficult to investigate. Now we're going to finish. This is an experiment, isn't it, Alan? And you've all got your hymn sheets. No. <laughs> Does it come up? I mean, the reason I've given you the words is because it really does describe a particular Italian experience. So what you've got is an ice cream man who is Antonio. You've got the poor deserted girl who's a dirty dirty player. You've got the pathos of it. But you've also got a certain degree 
of defiance as well um, in it. Uh, and just to round off with another, I would like a funny story, given you can't have this. Um, I also came across one of the Martyr brothers who had been taken to court having been accused of assault. Uh, and the person who had taken me to court was a neighbour called Rebecca. And uh, the, uh, the um, magistrate said to her, said to him, what's your relationship with Rebecca? And he said, well, I courted her for seven years. And then I decided she was too old for me. <laughs> <laughs> She's brought this place out of spite. Was what she said. Uh, too old for me. Uh, so uh, she's 27 and I'm 25. Uh, and poor old Rebecca, I did think, felt so sorry for her uh, because the case was Nick, uh, was, you know, I went on to track her down. She never married. Uh, but John, the person who had courted her and then deserted her, he did, of course. Uh, and he reminded me of this. She, in case Rebecca wasn't Jewish, it wasn't uh, Italian. Right, that my file into Italian was in leaves. So thank you very much. Before we take questions, can I just pass on a comment from Adrian Bailey, who says about the monkeys that you showed? He says the monkeys were reared in cages. By, in an area of Sheffield by a woman who kept a boarding house, and there are photographs in the archives of that. Right. And he does all, Adrian apparently works with ice cream people and emphasizes the fact there were a small number of very large families involved in the ice cream. Yes, yes. Do we have any questions in the room? What I was going to ask, Janet, is there any evidence of Italian community organisations in Leeds analogous to those that most of the other communities? I think did? they were no, not until <laughs> much later. Um, and I haven't really completed this work yet, but I think they're set up by the fascists. Right. Uh, it's on York Road. Uh, and it is called the House of Italy. Um, and there was certainly another branch in in <clears throat> in, in, in uh, Bradford. Um, so the whole story of how this community in Leeds um, deals with, in fact, uh, the arrival of Mussolini is what I will do the research on uh, because it is extremely interesting. Um, I think the Mussolini and his consuls, who was a, a consul in Leeds, um, were told to open up Italian schools. Lots of Italians, by the time we get to this period, didn't speak English at all, didn't speak Italian at all. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that the Casas de Italy did was actually have Italian lessons for adults and children, which of course things like Pol Polish club do now, don't they? It was the same, same sort of thing. But it's how political was it that was. Mm -hmm. any, any questions in the room? Mm -hmm. I, just a comment, Janet, that um, I didn't realize. Can I, can I just turn this round so people can see and hear you? They may not want to hear you, but they're not getting the choice. I didn't realize how significant the Italian collection was here, which stems, as you said, in 1771. Um, until it was sponsored by John Demoni from Salvo's yes. restaurant. Yes. And he wanted to make a little video of doing this. And he invited an Italian lecturer of the Italian Department of the University. And I was there. And she was picking books off the shelf and saying, here is this from 1770 something. There are books here you will not find in Italy, she said. And a little later, I introduced a, 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 a musical colleague from the College of Music, it was then and uh, she joined because of the Italian collection and the collection with opera and so on. And her party shot is she like, and I suppose you've got a Boccaccio. I said, yeah, but it's only a second edition. <laughs> this is a very significant collection. As it is of every, you know, Spanish, German, French, the lot. It's an American collection. I mean, I think that one of the things that it wouldn't just be Catania, who obviously did speak Italian. Uh, but yeah, the trading relationships was such that 
merchant houses sent their sons to places to learn the language so that there would be English merchants who were fluent in Italian because they will have served particularly in mm -hmm. Genoa for, you know, they may have lived there five, ten years uh, handling the business of their, their family uh, in the Italian woolen market. Um, so this is the reason for the library, that they are, uh, you know, multilingual, many of the woolen merchants. <laughs> Italian hairdressers. I only ask because my barber is Italian and he's been my barber for about 55 years. Uh, he's lived in Leeds about 58 years. He came from, he was in Leicester for a while. Uh, but he, he, he speaks English with a very broken accent and he's recently retired, but he goes into, he likes he likes coffee, but he only goes into Italian uh, cafes. He, he, he only eats out. He cooks for himself at home. He lives in Morley now, uh, and he only eats out in Italian restaurants. And he he has he's from Naples, and he doesn't really hasn't really. But I've seen quite a few uh, Italian hairdressers. He he actually has had hairdressers shops on in five different venues on Ball Lane for two years. So I just wanted to see something special. It is very common that they are hairdressers. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether this is a traditional craft from Italy itself, because uh, it certainly could have been an itinerant one uh, where you went round and cut people's hair. Um, so I don't know, but it is a common one to find them. Um, I couldn't find any from my period uh in Leeds, but I do come across them in, in other places. Um and um the um uh the other common one that you find is music teachers. Uh I mean there's a whole heap of things to really work on about women in these Italian communities. Uh so we think of it as a hurdy gurdy man. But actually, a lot of them were women. Now, whether once they'd married, they continued working, I doubt it. But they did work uh, on the streets, uh, just like, in fact, the men did. Uh, some also became dressmakers, um, you know, those sorts, of, those sorts of things. So it is, yes, you're right. Mm. It is absolutely common. Um, I think you do get this devotion to Italy. Mm. Uh, does he speak Italian? Oh, yes, yes. <clears throat> it goes back to Italy yeah. every summer. I the think month. they do. I think a lot of them do. Yeah. 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 The adverts you showed earlier referred to manufacturing English and foreign clocks and watches, which suggests there would be some significant difference between them. So one wonders in advance coming to lead, say, with their skills. Would they have appreciated the need to attune what they were offering to the English market? Oh, yes, I think they would, yes. How would they know that then? Well, Word because of that they would be part of, you know, I mean, the nearest you would find them probably in other places, you know, so they would have, they would go back well into the 18th well, century. What might the uh, difference be between an English and a foreign watch or club? Oh, dear. I'm disappointing in you. But... Uh, <laughs> I mean, what I did find very incredible was, in fact, the toys. I had never, ever associated them with the toys. Uh, and um, the, it's the Facelis have a toy shop on Wellington Street, which is three floors of just toys mm. uh, from huge rocking horses, you know, down to puppets and teddy bears and it was an emporium, a child, like Hamlin, I suppose. Uh, but that was uh, somebody who started out with a store on the central market. And I don't know if you notice, but if you go behind, um, do you know Central Street, which is behind Brigham's, um, off Kirkgate, behind there, 
that whole property was developed by a Vasali, uh, and it's actually got over the top of the Vasali house. They were people who made very, you know, made good, really, really big way. But it started from Troy's on the market. I think we've just time for one more common friend on to make one. If not, can I again thank Janet very much for her brilliant talk today and also for organising the whole series of lectures on diversity in Leeds. Given the great diversity of the Leeds community, we have in four talks only been able to scratch the surface of the different community groups in Leeds. And we are hoping to organise another series of these lectures next this time next year, where we will cover some of the communities we haven't been able to cover this year. Anyway, thank you very much indeed, Janet.